Remember what I said in the last episode? On something I've never done myself before, while simultaneously planning far enough ahead to not do something I might regret later on. Before I build the control electronics for the DIY real soldering station, I quickly want to point out and fix three issues with this soldering iron I knowingly swept under the rug at the end of the last episode. Because who would be dumb enough to tell their viewers at the end of an 18 minute video that basically what they just built is garbage? No, it's not garbage per se, but here is problem number three, and I did mention it beforehand. The yellow paint I painted the handle with. It quickly gets disgusting and sticky when you handle it for a while, because humidity from your hands softens the paint, and that's just an inconvenience spoiling the user experience. Number two, the power cable is just way too thick and too stiff. I originally planned to use a much thinner one, something like this, which would be easily enough to handle a 1 amp, but I didn't have a long enough piece of it, and since I was in a rush to get the video done, I just went with this one. And number one, lastly, while filming the soldering montage, I noticed the handle gets too hot in normal use. I may just have overestimated the insulating capabilities of wood, however, it just ruins the user experience even more if you can burn yourself on the handle. I mean, on a normal soldering iron, the handle might get warm over time, but certainly not hot. Now, I could have just glossed it over and silently fixed it off camera without anybody ever noticing, like many other YouTubers do. But I thought it was worth addressing, because even after drilling three rows of holes into it, the metal tube still transfers enough heat to melt HDPE at the point where this washer touches it. But I wanted it to be cold enough to not melt HDPE where the handle is, and since I cannot drill even more holes, I turned an entirely new handle with a different design in order to kill three birds with one stone. To the new design I also added these grooves to provide more grip, because I ultimately ended up not liking the pudgy ball roundness of the old one, but the real difference between the two is actually the size of this hole. On the old one the metal tube was basically just shoved directly into a hole in the wood, whereas on the new one there is a bigger diameter hole going quite a way in, so the tube really only touches the wood back here, where it's almost cold anyway, being mostly held in place by the washer here in the front. That way I get an air gap between the metal and the wood, which should hopefully do the trick in terms of insulating. The new handle is also not yellow, because I don't have any varnish that doesn't get sticky, so I made this one out of hardwood and only finished it with a very thin coat of DIY lacquer made by dissolving styrofoam in universal paint thinner. For the cable I'm now going to use this braided smartphone charging cable, which is very soft and floppy, and should theoretically also be capable of handling one amp. So let's put everything together. But first, let's take the old one apart. The easiest way to remove the handle is probably by destroying it. Now this is a really nice cross section, look at this. Yeah, that is so nice. You can absolutely see what's going on in there. To prevent the cable from fraying, I'll put some heat shrink tubing over it, along with the zip tie for the strain relief. Since it doesn't make any sense to have a 4 strand cable if only two of the strands are actually used, I'm connecting each of the power leads to one of the data lines so they can share the current. And now I just need to assemble it again. And that should be it fixed! Now the USB plug on the end can just stay where it is, because later I'm simply gonna use it to plug the soldering iron into the rest of the soldering station. That adds a little to the user experience. But other than that, this cable is much, much better. I can feel it already. It's way easier to move the soldering iron around and solder what you actually want to solder, instead of being constrained by a thick, heavy-duty cable. Anyway, the electronics! That's what you came for, after all. I spent about a week developing the circuitry, so here's the circuit diagram, along with the rather chaotic prototype. Which, by the way guys, can we just take a second to appreciate the fact that this circuit is made up of 100% reused components. That's right, every single one of the components we're going to use on this project was pulled out of some or another piece of e-waste. Hashtag recycling! But I digress. This is the circuit we're going to need. It allows me to adjust the power going through the soldering iron from about 15 watts 
all the way up to 30 watts and additionally there's a quick preheat function which automatically launches as soon as the power is turned on. If that sounds fancy, that's good! But before I slap this onto a circuit board and ultimately end the video here, I absolutely need you to understand how this circuit functions in order to do it any justice. So let's wind back a while and start at the beginning. When designing a circuit, we first of all need to assess what we actually want it to do. So in this case, I simply want to adjust the power going into the soldering iron, and mind you, I said temperature adjustment, not temperature control. Temperature control would mean it automatically keeps the temperature, guess what, under control on a consistent level. But that requires the temperature sensor inside the soldering iron, which in this case I don't have. So be it adjustable temperature. The best way to go about this is no doubt pulse width modulation. Remember this video I did about 6 months ago? This is basically the circuit we need. But there is a huge problem. Being based on an A-stable multivibrator, this circuit's resonance frequency is dependent on its supply voltage. And using a traditional old-fashioned transformer as a power supply, the voltage we get is anything but stable. In fact, the open circuit voltage on this specific transformer is around 44 volts, but as soon as I plug in the soldering iron, it instantly drops down to 30 volts. That's over 25% difference. Which means the analog PWM generator is going to have a hard time putting out anything reasonable unless I provide it with a reasonably stable input voltage. Let me introduce my circuit. For now, let's just grey out everything we're not interested in and focus on the power supply. Over here we've got AC in, a switch to turn it on or off and the transformer. Low voltage AC goes to a full bridge rectifier, which is actually comprised of two diodes in parallel for every diode there is, because the 1N40X diode series is only rated 1 amp, and running them at their limit all the time could potentially fry them. Then we've got a smoothing capacitor, and guess what? A transistor-based voltage regulator. This provides a more or less stable supply voltage between 11.5 and 12.5 volts for the PWM generator. Speaking of the PWM generator, this one is almost the same as in the original video, with three exceptions. First, I added two LEDs, because let's be clear, that's really what the video was missing back at the time. Then I blocked about half of the duty cycle adjustment with a resistor, since running this big soldering iron on anything below 15 watts results in it being too cold to even melt solder. And being able to adjust your soldering iron to 69 degrees Celsius doesn't really make sense, does it? And finally, instead of a power MOSFET, it's now switching a power transistor over a Darlington configuration to amplify the base current. Remember, in the original video I said I would have liked to replace the MOSFET with a transistor, but it didn't work? Well, turns out it's possible by simply adding a 5.1 volt Zener diode to the base of the first transistor in the Darlington configuration. That way we get a clean output signal switching on and off the power transistor, and with it, the soldering iron. But after everything worked the way it was supposed to, I realized there was a problem. On a low setting, the soldering iron takes ages to heat up far enough to even start melting solder. So we need to add a quick preheat function. This is the last building block in the already quite complicated schematic, a simple transistor delay timer which indirectly supplies the base of the power transistor with current through this LED full time until C5 is fully charged. The little push button next to it is just there to discharge the capacitor and relaunch the quick preheat cycle mid soldering should I ever need a short boost in temperature due to a particularly thick solder joint. So that's the circuitry. I just love analog electronics. I feel much more comfortable designing those than for example writing code, even if I occasionally blow up a component. I know I could have used a microcontroller, done full temperature control and even added a little display, but honestly, what's the fun of that if I can do it with 11 transistors? On top of everything, I just love the fact that it allows me to use 100% salvage components. That's a first for me on a circuit board that complex. And thinking about the second life all these components get, being useful for maybe another 5 years, that's just amazing. With that said, let's take apart the messy prototype and rearrange everything onto a circuit board!
And just like that, the circuit board is done. I double checked all the connections and even fixed some mistakes, so I really hope the magic smoke is going to stay inside the components because I don't have a replacement for quite a few of these transistors. It's not quite as messy and crammed as my circuit boards usually are because as you can see from the heatsink, things do get quite warm so it needs more space to radiate that heat. But apart from that, I just find strip board inconvenient to work with since it's very constraining, so I left myself a teeny tiny little bit more space to work with on this one. The heatsink, by the way, is a wonderful example of why when I take things apart, I like to keep as much of it as possible, because as I just proved, there will be a day where I need exactly this size of heatsink with placements for two transistors. And nothing is more annoying than realizing you chucked out the perfect match just two weeks earlier. But I guess there's no point in buying time, so let's power it up and see if it explodes. By the way, I did test the voltage regulator before soldering on everything else, because if the voltage regulator didn't work and 44 volts got onto the rest of the electronics, it could fry quite a lot of things. So at first, let's plug it in without the soldering iron connected to see if it works. Yep, the red LED lights up like it's supposed to with the other two flickering. Now, quick preheat should be running for about two minutes before shutting off and leaving control to the PWM generator. So now, I guess it's just a matter of waiting till the red LED goes off. Five minutes later. Um, it's not shutting off. For some reason, quick preheat never stops. And the more I think about it, the more I realize something about these other two LEDs seems off too, because as far as I know it should be the red LED flickering more than the green one, but it's the opposite. What happens if I turn up the variable resistor? Oh, it's the green LED lighting more and more and staying on all the time. That's just the wrong way around. That's definitely not working like it's supposed to. So I guess I need a little time to investigate. Ah, electronics. Never missing an occasion to embarrass me in front of my viewers. Anyway, it's fixed now. Turns out, doesn't work great with the PMP transistors soldered in the wrong way around. And while desoldering them to put them in the right way round, I somehow managed to kill one of them, so I had to swap it for a C9015 instead, which works just as well though. The issue with the red and the green LED being reversed was, like I assumed, just the change I had made during assembly. Thinking the 13K resistor was connected to the base of the wrong transistor on my assembly layout picture, I switched it around, ultimately just ruining it instead. Turns out, I did use my brains planning the layout after all, though obviously not enough to put the transistors in the right way around. So let me show you it in action. We shall finally plug in our soldering iron. By the way, this is the USB port you do never want to plug your phone into unless you want to have it fried, of course. So we're gonna plug it in, and I'm actually going to use my stopwatch to show you exactly how long quick preheat takes, starting the very moment I plug in the transformer. So, three, two, one, go. And now, the heatsink is getting warm. I'm actually going to hook this piece of solder onto the soldering tip, so it's going to melt when it gets hot enough. That way you can see exactly when that happens. And now it's just waiting. As you can see, quick preheat is running, the other two LEDs are flickering like they should, the green one being more flickery than the red one. This is about 55-60% duty cycle. So now it's just waiting. You can't really see the flickering on camera that well, that's because of the shutter, but believe me, it is what it is. It's going to preheat about 2 minutes 10 seconds, I tested it, but I believe solder starts melting at around 1 minute 30. Should now be about hot enough, yeah there it is, melting solder. As you can see here from the smoke, whoops, and in about 8 seconds, there it goes, it just fades out like that, 2 minutes 15 seconds of preheat. So now, if I turn up the variable resistor, it should 
or it is actually, going to be the red LED going brighter and brighter, with the green one getting more and more flickery until, lastly, the red one stays on all the time, and the green one goes off. And now it's on full power, 30 watts. And if you need a little boost in temperature, obviously only if your pulse width modulation is below 30 watts. So if I'm on 55 watt, uh, 55 pulse width modulation, I can get a little boost in temperature if I just push this button. And Quick Preheat has relaunched. Easily enough to melt solder. And that is it! It is finally working! Now, to mention a few important things, this circuit is tailored to these specific components, so if you want to build it yourself, you can't just plop in any old standard transistor, though you can probably replace most of the high-voltage ones with other, more ubiquitous high-voltage transistors, like the 13001 from Compact Fluorescent Lamps, that's where these also came from anyway. Then there are the two PNPs. These should be interchangeable with the likes of the BC557 or notably the C9015 like the one I used. Then there is the single V945P or whatever it's really called. I didn't find a datasheet for it. This could be a BC547 or equivalent. The reason why we need these three low voltage transistors in there is because they have a much higher current gain, without which it wouldn't work. Also, since we're already talking about what you need to do if you want to build this yourself, you absolutely need to match the two 1 microfarad capacitors in the PWM generator by measuring their real value, because with electrolytic capacitors the real world value can be a far cry from what is printed on the side. Next up, from an efficiency standpoint, this circuit is definitely rather terrible. I mean, the transformer isn't mind-blowing already, but the linear voltage regulator is definitely wasting lots of power just to provide high base current for the power switching transistor. This naturally wouldn't have been an issue had I used a MOSFET like in the original circuit, but then it would have been much harder to get 100% salvaged components since discrete MOSFETs are still comparatively rare in consumer electronics. So as a result, the heatsink gets quite hot, in fact, too hot for me to touch, which means at least 60 degrees Celsius, and like the old saying goes, where things get hot, efficiency is not. I just made that up, but it's true. Anyway, I guess it's about time to wrap this up here. I could keep talking for an entire hour, but I'm sure nobody wants to hear even more nerdy design details, so the link to the schematic will be in the description in case you want to have a go at this yourself. And by the way, the styrofoam lacquer didn't work at all, it's completely gone and the handle is practically bare wood now, so be prepared to see it treated with linseed oil in the next episode. Who would have thought the most difficult part of building an entire soldering station was the handle of the soldering iron? Don't forget to subscribe to see the last episode of this series and oh, since you stay till the end, here's a little treat for you. The thing you saw on the thumbnail, unless I changed the thumbnail of course, it's just a piece of cardboard with a few LEDs on it and a knob that does literally nothing at all. No, that's not clickbait. It's supposed to represent the electronics in a more relatable way. Whatever. See you next time. Bye!